Transform Church. So let's, let's see what we get to with this. Um, this is kind of the closing of the continuance series. We're, 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 if this isn't the last service, it, it, one of them at least. Um, and it very well may be the last one. But I, I want to address, right, we've been talking about this whole concept of continuance, and um, you've got to listen to the whole series, obviously. you definitely got to listen to the whole series. They're short messages. They're not long hour, hour messages. Um, they're all, you know, half an hour or, or under. Most of them are under half an hour. Um, that's why there's so many parts. But um, there is a lot of debate when it comes to the whole, like, losing your salvation thing, and we've gone through that. The reason why, the ultimate reason why people look at verses and they think that verses in the Bible talk about someone, that someone can lose their salvation, is because there's so many verses in the Bible that talk about people that have understood the truth and then they fall away. We've been through all of that, right? So with all that knowledge that we've talked about, the parable of the seed and the sower and all of that, I'm not going to rehash all of that. Um, we know that you can be enlightened. You can believe in Jesus, legitimately believe in Jesus, real faith in Jesus, and yet still not be saved, right? That's, the, that, that's kind of the culmination of all these messages that we've, we've, we've been through, is to kind of prove that point and show you all the places in Scripture where, where it talks about that. Um, and as we've said, again, I'll, I'll refer to the First John verse. I think it's First John chapter 2. Um, again, I think it's like verse 19. I could be wrong. But... Um, just explains that, you know, when someone leaves association with the body of Christ and, and, and doesn't seek God anymore, it just says, right, we understand that it doesn't mean that they lost their salvation, it's just a manifest token of the fact that they were, they were not of us, right? Meaning that they never actually came to a full assurance of faith and never got saved. And this is really no different. Um, everything that I'm about to say about this chapter, I genuinely believe this to be accurate. I'm not saying that there is nothing, there's nothing more for me to learn on this, but um, I really do believe that this is the, the correct, the proper interpretation of this, this chapter. Okay, so I just kind of want to show you that. Because in John 15, if you can bring John 15 up, uh, we're going to start reading from verse 1. Um, in John 15, there's this huge debate, and I remember it going on even when I was younger as well, about the fact that Jesus says that every branch in me that doesn't produce fruit, that he, he takes it away or he removes it. Um, and let me just read you the verse so you kind of know where I'm coming from. Uh, it's actually verse 2. It, it, if, we, if we just read verse 2, um, Jesus in verse 1 just says that he's the true vine. And then in verse 2 it says, Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. So people obviously take note of the fact that it says every branch in me. This is Jesus speaking. And he's saying there are people, which he's calling branches here, that are in him that are in him. He's referring to himself as the vine, and he says, every branch that's in me that doesn't bear fruit, I'm going to remove that, that branch. And people see that, and they say, well, obviously, being quote-unquote in Christ is applicable to a believer. The Bible even says, right, that if any man is in Christ, in Christ, that he's a new creation. So um, if the term in Christ is used in the Bible for people that are saved, then this must mean that if you are saved or quote-unquote in him and you don't bear fruit, which people just simply take to mean the fact that uh, if you don't do the right thing or if you're not being moral enough in your actions or you're not serving God enough or you're not committed to God enough or if you're lukewarm or whatever it is that we say, that God is going to remove you from being a branch in him. Okay. Very important, though to understand everything that we've learned up until now. Let's keep reading the whole context, and then I will show you uh, sort of really what this means. But before we even actually go into this, there is also an interpretation of this where it says that uh, every branch in me, where it says every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. The word take away there means sort of to, to take up. It can mean to lift up, or it can mean take up in the sense of, like, removal. A lot of people say, well, that doesn't mean removal. It just means to lift up. So this verse is really just saying that if God sees that a Christian isn't bearing fruit, um, that God will just lift you up. It doesn't mean to remove you. It just means to lift you up. I don't believe that. I believe it actually means to take away. I believe it actually means to remove you. Um, or, uh, you know, loose translations say to cut off. The word doesn't mean cut off. The word means just to take up. But I do believe 
by other verses, even Matthew 3.10, which I won't read to you right now. Matthew 3.10 is another verse that um, is sort of similar terminology, and I believe that this is referring to removing a person, not that this is just saying, oh, if you're not bearing fruit, God just will lift you up and encourage you or something. Uh, I think that's, that's sort of trying to move, almost sort of like trying to change the definition of this chapter to kind of suit the one saved, always saved agenda. I could be wrong on that, but that, that's kind of the way I perceive that. Anyway, this is, uh, when it says, every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away, I think that's a, a right translation. Okay, but let's just keep reading, though. So he says, every branch that's in him, Jesus says, every branch that's in and just so you know, punchline, this is not talking about someone losing their salvation. We've already been through that, but just punchline, that, that is the point here. But I'll show you why it's not. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, or that means he cleans it. Um, and so there's a lot I can say about that. Let's just leave all that off for right now. Let's just take that beginning part. Every branch that's in Jesus that bears not fruit, he takes away. Now let's go to verse 4. Now he says here, abide in me and I in you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you, except ye abide in me. You'll notice here, though, the person before that it said that Jesus takes away. This is really important. Um, and again, I believe this to be the true interpretation of this chapter. And I'll show you why from Hebrews 6. But he says, abide in me, and I in you. You see that both of those things? I need you to abide in me, and I in you. Notice the branch before that it says that he takes away. It does not say that he abided in them. It just says that they abided in him. If you'll notice that. He didn't say every branch that I abide in that doesn't bear fruit, I take away. He said every branch that abides in me that doesn't bear fruit, I take away. But then he goes into verse 4 and says he advises us to abide in him and also he in us. Uh, because the branch can't bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. I'll explain that in a second. Verse 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him. And I in him. Just notice the fact that it did not say about the branch that Jesus removes that he abides in them. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit, much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. And if a man abides not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and he is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Okay. This whole thing, you will remember that we read from Hebrews 6 a couple weeks ago, which again, you have to, you, you got to listen to this message in context of all the other ones, because I'm not going to explain all that again. That when you first hear the truth, before you're even saved, because we know that process, there's a process to getting saved. It's not just pray the sinner's prayer and pray a prayer, and then you're saved. We know that, right? Because the Bible, people say, well, yeah, but the Bible says, though, to confess Jesus, Lord, and you'll be saved. The Bible says to confess him and to believe in your heart. And it's the belief in your heart that's really important. If you just pray a prayer, that doesn't save you. It's the full assurance of faith that saves you. The confession by itself doesn't save you. Jesus even said that in the last day, people will, will, will call him, Lord, Lord, and he'll tell them to depart from him. So calling God, your, calling Jesus your Lord doesn't save you. Jesus says that right there. There's a lot of people that will call him Lord, Lord, and they're still not saved. It's the belief in your heart that counts. Now, when you truly do believe something in your heart in a full assurance way, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth will speak. It will force words out automatically. But it's the belief that counts. And we know that as you're growing in your knowledge, this is very important, and check Hebrews 6 on this. We, we've read this in the past already, though. As you are growing and you're tasting of the good word of God, you are actually, you start tasting of the power of the age to come. You start tasting of the power of God, and you start, um, this is the terminology, this is the terminology, the rain falls often upon you. That's the terminology in, in Hebrews chapter 6. And what that's talking about is that when, before you're even saved, when you start receiving the word of God, the Holy Spirit starts working upon you. And we went through all the terminology again in the past. But the Holy Spirit falling often upon a person is, is a common thing in the Bible. We talked about the manna in the children of Israel in the wilderness, how the manna fell often, right? You could say fell often upon them, was rained down often upon them. We talked about even Noah uh, and the rains that came down from heaven. And, and th there's a, a few examples you can use here. 
Again, if, if, if you're not familiar with this, or if you just don't remember what I'm saying, go back and listen to uh, the rain falls often part of this series. But when you first get saved, the Bible refers to, to that as the rain, which is we're actually talking about the Holy Spirit, falling often upon you. In other words, the Holy Spirit does not actually permanently dwell inside of you. He hasn't made you his home yet. You're just tasting of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is falling often upon you from heaven. You're receiving from heaven above you often. And that's the tasting process. When you get saved, it refers to that as you drinking in the rain that was falling often upon you, if you'll remember from Hebrews chapter 6. So as you're tasting, that's the rain falling often upon the ground. You're the ground. And then the rain falling often upon you as you're tasting. But then when you actually get saved, it says now you have drunk in the rain that was falling often upon you. Those are two different kinds of people. Tasting, or you could say bearing some fruit, is you just tasting of the power of God. Okay? Uh, th that's that rain falling often upon you. Upon you. It's important that it says upon you. When you get saved, that's you drinking in the rain, and now the rain that was upon you is now inside of you. You could say that this person was abiding in the rain because the rain was upon them, but when you get saved, the rain is in you, or Jesus now abides in you. You see the two differences? For the Lord to be upon you is different than the Lord being in you. Those are two different things. If the Lord is upon me, that's actually referring to the Holy Spirit manifesting, uh, either manifesting himself from on the inside of me if I'm a believer, or for an unbeliever, if the Holy Spirit is working upon me, that's just talking about the Holy Spirit visibly working upon my body. Uh, even, in, even the disciples, let me, I'll, show the, I'll throw the reference out to you. Don't go here, but Acts 4.33 talks about how the apostles were doing all these miracles and stuff, and it says, and great grace was upon them. That's important that it says upon them, because when the grace of God is working upon you, that can be applicable to a believer or an unbeliever. Because, again, an unbeliever with some knowledge of the truth can have the grace of God working upon them. Again, it refers to unbelievers or that tasting process as the rain falling often upon you, very often upon you. So the grace of God can work upon you. But when you get saved, that rain that was falling or just working upon you is now drunk into you, and now Jesus abides inside of you now, not just working superficially upon your body. All the tasting that an unbeliever does when they're first receiving the word of God is all superficial upon them. It's the Holy Spirit working visibly upon their body. They can receive healing. They can, they, again, the Bible says they taste of the power of the age to come, but it's all just tasting. It's not a permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. They're just tasting of the, of, uh, they're becoming partakers of the Holy Spirit and just tasting of the power of the age to come. It's like, again, it's, it's, it's that ground in the parable of the seed and the sower that as they receive the word of God, is that they bring forth no fruit to perfection, right? But they do bring forth some fruit. They just don't bring it forth to perfection. That just means that they only taste of the grace of God. They don't actually receive it in full yet. So we understand all this from the, from the, from the series past. Um, and again, it's Hebrews 6, 7, the, the verse I was quoting. And so that's why it's important to note that he says, every branch that abides in me. Now, I'm going to answer the questions about the in me, in Christ. I'm going to answer that question in just a second. But it's important to note that if you are in Jesus, let me give you another example. This is going to be a little too much to explain right now. But being in Jesus or Jesus being upon you, Again, that's talking about Jesus working manifestly and visibly upon your body. For a believer, that, can, that obviously happens with us because we have drunk in the rain already. We've drunk in the Holy Spirit already, but the Holy Spirit manifests and springs up from on the inside of us, and he does work upon us, right? And so uh, we are the tabernacle of God. He's inside of us, and then he manifests and he works upon our body. And again, when great grace is upon us, that means great grace is now working manifestly in our bodies. But for a believer, we also have that grace inside of us. Whereas an unbeliever doesn't have that grace living permanently on the inside of them. They, just ha they only have the grace of God working superficially upon them. For a believer, that, 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 that water that we've drunk in, like John 4 says, springs up out of us and manifests to our body. Whereas if you're unsaved, it's not springing up from on the inside of you. It's falling from heaven above you falling often upon you. You're receiving directly from heaven above you. 
for a believer, it springs up from on the inside of you, from John 4. Again, listen to the revealing series for more on that, right? We, we, we've been through that before. And so when it's, Jesus says that there is a kind of branch that abides in him, it never says that he abides in them. And I believe that that is a huge uh, thing that people miss. They think almost like it's, he's just using those two things interchangeably. He never says in this chapter that anyone that he abides in, that they are, it never says that they are removed. Only the, and, and furthermore, it only says, if you'll notice, it says a branch that abides in him bears fruit. Listen to this very closely. The branch that he's talking about here that only abides in him. In other words, he's upon them. The branch that he doesn't abide in them, but they are in him. In other words, that he is upon them. It never says they bear much fruit either. It just says they bear fruit, which to me also denotes that they are tasting and they're not fully receiving. Because only the person that abides in him and he in them bears much fruit. Because that's now a full receiving. We've moved on from just tasting of the fruit to now fully receiving of the fruit. You'll notice that. The person that, does, that he does not abide in them, it never says that they bear much fruit. It only says they bear fruit, which again, that makes sense because if you're only abiding in Jesus and he's not in you yet, all you can do, because you don't have a full assurance of faith yet, you can only taste of the fruit and taste of the grace of God, but you're never fully receiving. You are incapable of fully receiving the grace of God. You're just receiving drips and drabs of the rain that's falling from heaven. Again, Christ upon you, upon the ground, but not in the ground because you don't, you don't have a full assurance of faith yet. For a believer, though, we can bear much fruit. We've moved on from merely tasting of the fruit. We can bear much fruit. And why is that? Because it's not just that we're abiding in Christ. It's not that just Christ is upon us. Christ is in us now. We've fully received him, we, we, and, and we can bear much fruit now. In other words, there's a full receiving that can happen in our lives now because we have drunk in the rain. He's not just abiding upon us. We're not just abiding in him. He's now inside of us. Christ abides in us as believers. Um, okay, so hopefully that makes sense because that's pretty much, that's, that's the deal with uh, John 15. But what I do want to address is, but Pastor Mike, it does say they abide in him. And isn't that kind of like a weird terminology to use though, to abide in him because the Bible talks about believers and it specifically uses the term in Christ to refer to believers. Like if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. So if it says they abide in him, doesn't that mean they're new creations? It depends on the way you use the term in Christ, right? It and, and I'm not making this up. This is a, a fact. It depends on the way you use it. Um, being in Christ in like 2 Corinthians, I believe that is, right? Chapter 5, where it says if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. That in Christ is referring to, I believe, just being in the body of Christ. But it's important, the in and upon, all those words are very important. When it says that we're in Christ, what does that mean? Does it just mean that Christ is manifesting upon us? No, there it's referring to us being a part of the body of Christ. It, it, being in Christ there is, just, is referring to us being, because we're obviously just one vessel or one stone in the collective body of Christ. We are in Christ in that sense, and I believe that that's what that's referring to there. In Christ, though, can refer to literally being, I'm in him. He's manifesting upon me. And they're just talking about two different in him. One is referring to the literally, I'm in Christ in the sense that Christ is manifesting upon me. Whereas when it says if any man is in Christ, that's not referring to you being like in the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit working upon you. That's talking about you being in Christ, meaning that you are in his body now. You are a part of his body now. And if any man is a part of the body of Christ, he is a new creation. What that's certainly not saying is that if any man has Christ manifesting upon them, he's a new creation. That's, it, it, it's just it's two different usages for that. It, 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 he's saying two different things. We, we certainly know by now, for instance, for instance, if someone comes up here and is not saved, and uh, they, they, they get prayed over, and they receive a healing, Christ was upon them. They were in him in that sense because he was working upon them. They're still unsaved. That doesn't mean they're a new creation just because you receive something from God. The rain fell off and upon them, but it doesn't mean that they're saved. Um, so again, hopefully this is kind of makes sense, but being in, in him in that sense in John 15, 
is not referring to the same thing as when, it, when we say we're in Christ. It just depends on what you're, if you're talking about we're in the body of Christ, yes, that's always talking about a believer. If you say someone is in Christ in the sense that Christ is just working superficially upon them, but you see, you see how important the words in, upon, if it, it's not the same thing. Let me say this also. It's not the same thing for God to say that he's in you versus him saying that you're in him. Those are two different things. It's important uh, that we recognize the terminology there. Let me give you another example, and I'll probably have to close soon after this, but we are called the tabernacle. This is a great example, actually. We are called the tabernacle of God right now. Why are we called the tabernacle of God right now? Because Jesus dwells inside of us. We are upon him. We've been through the whole thing about even like the ark upon the mountain and all that stuff in, in the past as well, right? We are upon him. That, 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 that's a truth. We, we are called God's tabernacle because he lives inside of us. Do you know that in Revelation, and you can check me up on this, in the book of Revelation, God is called our tabernacle. Hear, hear me out. God is called our tabernacle in Revelation, which is referring to the resurrection. Because you know that every person walking this new, or at least every believer in the new earth, will have Christ manifesting upon them in full, right? Whereas we don't see that now in every believer right now. In the resurrection, Jesus will manifest through us in full. So doesn't that make sense that Jesus would be called our tabernacle? Why would he be called our tabernacle in the resurrection? Because we'll be dwelling fully inside of him. He'll be working completely through our body. So it makes sense that now the glory of God has enveloped us. Not just that the glory of God is inside of our body. That would make our body his tabernacle. And our body will always be his tabernacle. But there does come a time when there's full manifestation through you where God is now called your tabernacle, which means you are dwelling in him. I, you know, let me, let me just, I have, I have like a, just a couple minutes. Let me see if I can get you that verse. And I may, I may not be able to get it for you right now. And if not, I will get you the verse... Um, after service. In fact, if I remember, maybe I'll put it up on the screen right now for people watching online if I remember later to do that. Um, yeah, I, I will have to get it for you later. I will have to get it for you later. And again, if, if I remember, I will put the, the verse up there. But isn't that an interesting thing, though, that, we, that God would be called our tabernacle in the age to come? And maybe it's because it's not in the book of Revelation. Maybe it's just a prophecy in the, in the Old Testament. But that God would be called our tabern tabernacle. And do you see the difference between us being in him and him being in us. Us being in him means he's working upon us manifestly. Him being in us means that he's dwelling inside of us. And that's, I think, the big misconception with John 15 is that the person that it refers to that is taken away is referring to a person that is solely, solely abiding in him. So, that someone that is solely has Christ upon them versus someone that is... Uh, abiding in him and Jesus in them. The Bible will never refer to that person, and you can see from John 15, that person is never said to be taken away. That person is never said to be removed as a branch from the vine. Only the person that was, had the rain falling off and upon them, but never actually had Jesus abiding in them. They never drunk in the rain, um, only that they, it was upon them. Yep, 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 yep. I just want to make sure I got everything good. All right. Uh, I was trying to keep my terminology straight. Hopefully I said it because they'll abide in him and you, us and in him and him and us and it starts getting a little bit confusing. But hopefully I kind of kept my wording straight as well. Again, and, and, and just, just to wrap this up here, that's why also you, you do have to differentiate what he's saying when he says in Christ, like every, any man that's in Christ is a new creation versus when it talks about us abiding in him in John 15 or in that verse that I just mentioned before about him being our tabernacle, they are talking about two different things. And let me, let me actually give you one more example for this, and then I'll stop. Um, when it refers to us being in Christ, as if any man is in Christ, is a new creation, there is um, the concept of us being in Christ, I believe is referring to, again, us being in the body of Christ. Because even the Bible talks about there are many abodes in the house of God. In John, whatever that is, chapter 14, I think. Um, that there are many abodes in the house of God. And what does that mean? 
That's saying that we are all individual dwelling places in God's full house, which is the body of Christ as, at large, the body of Christ as a whole. You can't just skim over, though, where it says in Christ. For a long time, I, I wondered what that meant, because I, I know that Christ is in me, but what does it mean if any man is in Christ? Because I kind of, I started learning the fact that in Christ just means that something's manifestly working upon me, and I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense. If, if I receive anything from God at all, if he's working manifestly upon me at all, that means that I'm a new creation. But again, in Christ, I believe there's referring to more that we're in his body, that we are a dwelling place in the body of Christ at large. But the whole in and upon and all those terminologies, uh, it, it's important to take note of all those things individually because, again, it makes a huge difference as to whether you're abiding in him or whether he's in you or the, the, the positional wording there is important to take note of those details because it does make a difference. It makes a humongous difference. And again, I'll just rehash that one more time. In John 15, it does not ever refer to the person that Jesus is abiding in. If Jesus is abiding in you, it never refers to that person ever being taken away, only the people that uh, are abiding in Jesus. And, and there is a kind of person that can abide in Jesus, but is not saved yet and does not have Jesus abiding in them. Right? That person is not saved yet. So anyhow. Um, and oh, actually, just before you guys go, uh, it's Revelation 21, verse 22. That's the, that's the verse. So Revelation 21, verse 22. It just says, um, and I saw no temple therein. Again, this is in, um, speaking about like the new earth. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Referring to believers that the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb will be our temple. So anyway, that's, that's the verse for you. We hope you enjoyed this message from Reform Church. If you have, please share this with someone else and help us get this unpopular message to the world. If you'd like to support Reform Church, you can do so at reforminus.com slash give. Also on our website, you can take advantage of our free messages, articles, and even full discipleship courses. Start reforming your mind now at reforminus.com.